911. What are you reporting? Uh, we got someone or something crawling around out here. Did you see what it was? Was it a person or an animal? or? I can't tell. All I know is that my central light came on and I just happened to glimpse and see this thing running across the yard. Uh, a good-sized man or something that looks like a man. I don't know what it was, just that it ran across the yard. Okay. You've had problems in the neighborhood before? Yeah, my dog was killed here just recently. I don't know what it was. Whatever it is, it's running. I couldn't catch it if I was going to chase it. But whatever it was, it was standing up. I'm out here looking through the window now and I don't see anything. I don't want to go outside. Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? Deal! Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. Okay, hang on. He's right... Is he in your yard, sir? Yeah, I got him. He's big. Okay, what's he doing in your yard? He's looking at me. Oh, and the guy is on foot. Just... I don't know. what. It, it's, it's a big... Real big person. That's all I can say. Okay, but it is a it is a person. I, uh, yeah, I'd say it was a person. Somebody really big. But he's all in black. He's. Is he a black male or a white male? Did you actually see whether, or was he just wearing black? He's all black and he's big. He is big. This is the Book Laws Crew. Folks, we got a great treat for you in this episode. He started his field research back in 1969, which was a decade before our own Thomas Steenberg. He, he's a heavyweight in the Bigfoot world, believe me. And I will take odds that if you threw up a name from the Bigfoot community, then this guy has either worked with them or for them at one point in time. He was and continues to be a go-to guy in the Pacific Northwest, and I'm speaking about none other than Rick Knoll. Now, if you have not heard of Rick Knoll, well, let me tell you, you do not know the subject of Bigfoot half as well as you thought you did. I can also tell you that in spite of my couple of decades experience studying the Sasquatch phenomenon, these guys, Thomas and Rick, make me feel like a newbie on the subject. I, I can't wait to have these guys speak. So without further ado, let's bring my co-host out here right now. And uh, we have Mr. Bill Reed. How are you doing, Bill? Oh, pretty good yourself. Not too bad. Uh, yeah, joining I'm really, him. Joining I'm really him. for today's, uh, I have, I've never had the opportunity to meet Rick. Uh, I've uh, looked forward to this for a long time. So uh, glad we we're finally able to do this. It's going to be a real treat, man. It is going to be a real treat. And also the irrepressible Thomas Steenberg. Hello, Thomas. Hello, Gary. How are you today? I am good. And I'm unlike good. other podcasts that ramble on for 15 minutes talking about nothing, the Book Watch crew like to jump into it right away. You came to hear the guests, not us. And so without any further ado, I will give you Mr. Rick no. Hello, Hi, Rick. Howdy. I'm glad you could make it. I've been looking forward to this for a long time, and so has Bill, as he uh, just said. So um, now, Rick, I've been a follower of yours since, oh, God, late 90s, early 2000s. Back in the day, I regularly posted on Bigfoot forums as uh, Grand Cherokee, and you would post there as a damn dirty ape. <laughs> And uh, I learned a lot from reading your post, man, uh, about how to set up your own research area and how to make superior track castings, et cetera, like that. So when I started these podcasts, I could think of, God, he's up there in the top three people that I want to have on this podcast. Yeah. But anyway, let's talk about you. <laughs> 
Now, I read that you were initiated into the world of Bigfoot by stories that you heard from friends and family, and they would do so as to distract you from dwelling on a traumatic incident which occurred when you were young. Yeah. And is that accurate? Is that how you first heard about Bigfoot? Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, I had a cousin that was working on one of the bridges out of Happy Camp in Northern California. And yeah. uh, he was a rebar construction worker. So he was the foreman. He could t say what was going on. And he brought uh, his son and myself and my brother uh, to uh, to the area to, to stay for a week. And it was uh, in 69. It was uh, at the time, just a week before uh, the moon landing. Um, so I remember that distinctly because of the moon landing. <clears throat> and uh, we stayed on uh, the Klamath River camping. And one day, uh, my my brother wanted and and my cousin wanted to uh, go and fish at the river. They brought their fishing poles, and I said, "Yeah, fine." Uh, my cousin was up on the bridge, and he was talking about later in the week that he was going to have me try and lift some of this uh, rebar. That rebar is like 135 pounds per person on their shoulder. And it takes two people to lift some of that stuff. It's uh, and then walk into the grid uh, that they they tie it together. Yeah. Uh, ten by ten grid on on top of the bridge before they pour the concrete. So I wasn't really looking forward to it, but it would you know it'd be interesting to see what a, what I could do. And my brother and my cousin says they wanted to go across the river on the other side where we were camped and uh, they decided uh, they found a spot where they could walk across. So I'm sitting on the side of the, the river uh, reading a book and uh, I see them walking across and all of a sudden they fell and the, the rocks slipped underneath their feet and, and uh, they started going down the river and I knew there was a waterfall a little bit further down so I was you know, really scared and I just picked up a, an axe and to use as a cane and ran across that river. I don't know how I, I did it, but I got across. They didn't. Uh, I didn't spend very much time with my feet on, on the actual rocks. It was going so fast. And got on the other side, came back into the river and held the axe out and pulled my cousin out and then uh, raced down the river again, got out and raced down the river uh, bank on the opposite side and uh, went back out in the water and and uh, it took me two times to get the axe out to the axe handle out to my brother and finally pulled him out and when I pulled him out everything was gone he was stark naked the the water had ripped off all those clothes his shoes he was bloody and all the fishing gear was gone and uh, we had to walk back around uh, down to the bridge where they were working and walk across the bridge and everybody was wondering you know who are they and what, what was going on and my uh, my cousin uh, told them i guess my the, it was a, my second cousin that was in the water with my brother because it was his son i think that's a second cousin right um and so i you know i had nightmares for that about that that he died in that river and uh i guess to get my mind off of it it didn't work you know hauling some of that rebar um, I fell a couple of times so they started telling me stories to get my mind off of it and uh, they were Bigfoot stories and there was some interesting ones you know about uh, about finding uh, great big uh, barrels turned over rolled down the hills um, uh, some people were camped uh, right at the edge of one of these um, uh, uh, depots for the fuel for the graders and for the um, uh, forklifts that they were using and um, they said that there was some uh, activity outside of the vehicle and banging on the on the vehicle they were afraid that it was a bear or something and nobody said that they actually saw the creature but uh, uh, they found a lot of footprints and stuff not while I was there but but that's what mm -hmm. that's how I got uh, the information to start with well, Rick, when you became a researcher, how were people able to get in touch with you 
to tell their stories. I mean, did were you Lake Thomas? Did you advertise in the newspaper? You know, Bigfoot encounter. Call me. You know, no. <laughs> call Saul. <laughs> no, no. I. Uh, it was just word of mouth at the very beginning, and then I hooked up with uh, Doc uh, Grover Krantz. Uh, not uh, not Grover Krantz. Uh, Dick Grover. And uh, he had a uh, some sort of a network where he would get information, and um, he would pass stuff off on on to me when uh, things happened. He came to my house a couple of times. It was right up the street from Five Fights Drive, where he had his famous uh, bent um, s sign on the side of the road that he he picked up uh, a, a girl and a guy, uh, two teenagers that were in a truck, claimed that. Uh, a Bigfoot crossed in front of them and hit the sign. Wow. And, um, so I lived up the street from, from where that was. And I met with him, went down to Olympia when they were trying to change the, uh, the state animal mm -hmm. into for Bigfoot and recognize it as a real animal. Grover was at, at the beginning of that. Uh, and then, uh, then I went to college. Well, first I went to, you know, got in the military and I was in the Coast Guard. But when I came back, I went into uh, Green River Community College and formed a, a after hours group there on uh, Bigfoot research and, and uh, hooked up with uh, uh, David Smith, who we worked quite a, uh, a lot together and went on a couple of trips down to uh, Mount St. Helens. And then I hooked up with Peter Byrne. And Peter Byrne, uh, started funneling stuff into the college uh, to me, and then we would go out and, and investigate stuff. And then uh, uh, Renee DeHinden and John Green both heard about it and started funneling stuff into them, into the uh, into me as well for area uh, stuff that was happening in the areas that I uh, was um, mainly focused on, which is Washington. You see, the reason I ask that is I want to make a comparison between your American experience and, say, Thomas's Canadian experience. And uh, there is, you know, being from two different cultures. Now, you say that it was, it flowed to you, it came to you, this information. Whereas Thomas <laughs> had to beat the bushes and practically pay people to talk to him about Sasquatch, right. you know? So, yeah, I I had a lot of people, you know, um, they didn't have a, a, a real interest in it, but they were uh, curious that I was associated with a college somehow, and would uh, give me information. And then after after that, I hooked up with Bob Walls, who's now a a, a cultural anthropologist um, back east, and he was. He got married to a very rich lady, uh, candy manufacturing, you know, something like Hershey's or something like that. Mm -hmm. But he uh, uh, he was going to the University of Washington, and I helped him uh, with his research paper, his uh, thesis, uh, about uh, how loggers in uh, the Pacific Northwest treated the subject of, of Bigfoot and how it could affect their livelihood and how they – were reluctant to talk about mm -hmm. it, even though there was a lot of uh, researchers going behind um, the loggers' backs and going directly to Weyerhaeuser and asking them to put it in their newsletter, which I got several copies of the newsletters that they sent out and asking for people to come forward and talk about Bigfoot that they may have seen out on the job. Uh, this is before the spotted owl, and so they didn't really mm -hmm. understand what could happen but the loggers were pretty intense people you didn't uh you know you didn't want to call them out or anything you wanted to whatever they said you believed <laughs> otherwise uh you were in for it but yeah so it, it it pretty much flowed to me because i think it was the association with peter and uh college mm -hmm. now thomas you got just the opposite kind of thing like I said, you had a big bower and swindle people to even mention Sasquatch. Nobody wanted anything to do with the subject. Basically, but I must point out, I never paid anybody a dime. So. 
Okay, it's yeah. official. Yeah. You didn't pay anyone. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Rick Towney, you're a professional photographer, right? Uh, yeah, I, I I do a lot of photography and video work for Boeing right now. Uh, and uh, also I've worked with uh, Doug Highcheck and uh, White Wolf Productions and a couple yeah. other uh, uh, network productions that he was working. So can you tell me how it is that the Bigfoot world is awash with blurry, out of focus, off-centered <laughs> pictures of blob squatches? <laughs> is it operator error? mechanical malfunction or purposeful hoaxes. I want to know why is there never a qualified photographer in an area where there is a Bigfoot? <laughs> well, who, who got the, the best picture so far of a Bigfoot? What would you say, Thomas? If you don't get this right, Jerry, I'm going to hold this over yeah. your head forever. I want you to answer his question. Who, who took the best picture? Yeah. Uh, image of a Sasquatch so far. Well, if they exist, probably the uh, Patterson Gimlin film. Yeah. If they exist. If he had gotten that. If they wrong. don't exist. <laughs> well, well, when he said picture, I said, has anyone ever taken a good picture? Well, those are those are moving <laughs> pictures, but yeah. 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 So he practiced and practiced and practiced. He he was like practicing uh, with a holster with the camera coming out. Really, mm -hmm. he he was it was fluid. He was he was had a search image in his head that if he saw one, he was pulling his camera out. That's what he was going to do. He wasn't going to freak out. He was he was preparing himself totally for seeing one, and so he practiced with that that uh, little uh, you know thigh holster. And uh, with that camera sitting in there, and it was he didn't even own the camera. No, he rented it. As a matter of yeah. fact, he, they were issued a warrant for his arrest when they failed to return it. So people, when they pick up a camera, uh, you know, with film, it's one thing. You know, it's expensive. Okay, you don't pick up a camera and shoot and shoot and shoot unless you're a professional because it costs money to get it developed and mm -hmm. the, the film and all that. But digital, you should be shooting everything. You should be really practicing and, and to not be afraid. And I know that he went to the zoo a lot and practiced there. He, uh, he was uh, practicing on horseback, which is what his preference was for, you know, out in the woods uh, for transportation. Um, and so that's really what it's all about is preparing yourself and, and that search image that he had. And then when he went on trips, that's what it was all about. It was, uh, he, he wasn't down on the ground tracking. He wasn't listening for anything really. He was just riding his horse because you can't really hear anything on a horseback. Can't really see good tracks on, on a horseback. I mean, maybe, uh, Native Americans could, but. Like maybe Gimlin could, I'm not sure, but that's pretty far away from the ground to look at tracks. You'd have to get back down onto the ground to check. And that gets tiring if you do that 20 times in a day. Mm -hmm. So they're just riding around and they're waiting for something to jump out at them. Now I had, I had a mountain lion jump out at me on a horseback. I wasn't prepared for that. And that got me yeah. thinking, you know, what happened is if, if that was, would have been a Bigfoot. That jumped out, and not a not a cat. Same thing. Yeah, because you only prob possibly will only get about four seconds. Yeah. Of, of time to uh, take a picture, if and and uh, I mean even myself, it would take about you know if it was to have to be turned on and ready to go. We're talking about twenty five thirty seconds, you know. Right. Even a one-legged frog could cross the road faster than that. So you got to have the camera primed and ready to go. They say, you know, the best thing to do is just take a picture of anything. Get used to taking pictures of birds. Take a picture of a squirrel. Take a picture of whatever. And and the other thing is, and and I and I uh, beat Thomas up about this all the time because he's being stubborn about it. But oh, cool. you know. Things like dash cameras, like if you if you're driving around the back roads looking for Sasquatch, have a good quality dash cam. They're digital, 
you put a good card in it, and you leave that running. Yeah, it's not the best pitcher, but but if something runs out, at least you have something. And if you have time to stop, and that's not a dash cam. That gets you two hours at most. And same as if you're out hiking. You know, the guys with the action cameras that are that are running. So just use this. <laughs> Yeah, but even even with that, you you you've got to get it on. Where if you've got an action that's, camera that's strapped on your, yeah. on your 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 shoulder or on your your uh, hat that's always running, even when you're going to grab your other cameras, at least you've got that footage. And I think that's one of the big advantages that we have today is we have the ability to have a digital camera running basically all the time that doesn't cost anything. I mean, I can remember being a kid with my dad with his giving me his little super eight uh, film and, you know, going hunting and, you know, every, what, three or four minutes, you're there trying to reload it because you've used up the film on nothing. And, and then having to wait until you send it out, get it processed and you find out all these great shots that you thought you had, you had a, you know, you had a, a magpie that you can barely see on it because of the, uh, the, the focal length on the, on the, uh, right. so I think, yeah, well, you know, I mean I mean, I side by side, and I mean, I always have a camera running on the front of the side by side. It's usually good for two hours before it'll start recording over again. The point and is, it's continuous, though. Continuous, yes. As long as the ignition is on, that's on. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, like Bill said, that's the only problem with this Air Pro is it's two hours, but once it's full, you gotta download it or erase it in order to get it to go again. It's mm -hmm. not continuous, yeah. Mm -hmm. But still and all, it's it's um, it's rather curious uh, with all the cameras that are out there and everybody has a camera these days that there hasn't been a single decent picture taken. And even if there was a single picture taken, do you think you'd be able to get away with saying this is actually a Sasquatch before somebody <coughs> says, no, it's CGI or it's been tampered with or blah, blah, blah. Well, they say the same thing about the PG film. There's still a lot of people who say it's, it's a guy in a suit, so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I still got a Bill Miller's uh, tree cameras here that take uh, the 36 roll of uh, uh, what, 35 millimeter. 35 film. millimeter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He also he had a it. Super 8 uh, video camera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That he preferred over digital because digital could be too suspect. So. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, it's either or. I mean, you get one of today's modern 4K cameras, and if you were out there and you got a really good shot with a 4K camera that was fairly close, I mean, it would be hard to argue with it, especially if you have the raw, have it in in a raw data film, where or raw data where you can give it to, you know, experts to look at it and see that it's not being digitally touched. Um, and I think. You know, if that's where we're, we're we're going, we all think of the Photoshop and that. But you know, if you, if you're recording in raw, and Rick, you know, you you know far more about it than I do. Um, you know, if you have that basic data in there, you can see if it's an original shot or not. Yeah, the metadata on there, uh, is, you know, pretty foolproof. Yeah, that doesn't lie. That doesn't but, lie. Uh, you know, if you look at what NASA's doing on Mars, they're looking for life. And they've got cameras, and there's got a whole bunch of people coming on and seeing uh, rats and lizards and fish and all sorts of things on the surface. And they're just uh, imagining what they're seeing. Really? It just looks like it. You know, it's not like it's it's really there. Faces but, in yeah. the clouds, yeah. Right. But yeah. You know, NASA is not saying that, uh, that they're going to find life with, with photography. You're not going to mm. find if there was life on on another planet, they'd want to either capture it or get uh, other types of uh, uh, evidence. And, and on another planet, it would be uh, you know um, the byproducts left by it. Um, you know what kind of gases are left and and uh, stuff like that. Trace elements um, left behind. So photography might not be the entire answer that you're looking for. I mean, it's, it's one of the things, but, uh, and just being prepared for yourself to see one and you see anyone is not going to convince anybody either. And it's probably what Grover and John Green always said and, and Renee 
is that you know you got to have a body. Mm-hmm. It's what it's what basically the scientific community has always claimed. They, there's only one way to prove the existence of Sasquatch, and that's when they get what they've always demanded: a body or a piece of body or sufficient skeletal remains. Yeah, and Ooh. that's just how it works. And no amount of put can collect wishful thinking will ever change it. I mean, right now we've got some DNA stuff, and everything it just keeps on coming back. That it's it's as close to human as it should be. It it it, it must have been human because it got nothing else that's that close that isn't human. Mm-hmm. You know the DNA. I've got you know uh, Owen Caddy went on a, on a trip up to uh, Marysville. And because we got a report and uh, some guy walked out on his on his back porch and uh, that's where they put the refrigerator and in, in a lot of uh, little cabins out there because there's no room inside. And there was a light bulb there and the Sasquatch came up and uh, hit the light bulb with his head and left blood. We collected the blood and it went to Todd Distel and he said, well, that was Jane Goodall because that's the last person I tested, and it was as close to Jane Goodall as it is anything. <laughs> so it's the same thing. DNA, if until we have DNA and find out that it's only one percent different than human, we don't know mm-hmm. what kind of DNA we're looking for or what 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 the DNA that we collect is. Well, is it because you don't have that prime? Right. I mean, if I collected, if I collected a tooth. Yeah. Uh, somewhere and uh you know and it was uh, uh contemporary it wasn't uh, a fossilized tooth and it was huge um that's evidence that's physical evidence they'd have to answer where, where did it come from what what kind of animal made it yeah well what? you remember rick uh, dr uh daryl lowenstein no. the university of san francisco when he looked at those uh DNA sample sent to him, one from Colorado, one from uh, the late uh, Bob Titmus. And he said, well, of course, back then, in the mid-90s, he had to grind up the samples because that was the way they did it. Mm-hmm. And he came back and said, well, it, it reacts positively with human and reacts positively with chimpanzee. So we either got some uh, a human running around out here with very odd problems or someone's mm-hmm. unleashed a... Uh, uh, release a chimpanzee with very odd problems, or we got something new that's similar to both. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Rick, when, uh, go when, ahead. We, when we found the uh, the Skookum cast, or the Skookum impression, um, that we left out fruit, and uh, and there was a lot of remains of that fruit uh, that fell out of the mouth or whatever was eating it. And there was a lot of dentition marks in there. Or it could have been finger marks. I'm not sure. But this is a cast of one of those. And um, it sort of looks like uh, it could either be a big finger or a tooth that went down in and and ate it. This was the cast that Meldrum made out of the apple bits that were Mm -hmm. left. It's huge compared to anything that we're used to it's not canine it's not uh you know like uh a carnivore's tooth yeah it's not a biter more like a grinder like a cow or some kind of cattle but it could, elk. or it could be a finger i don't know <laughs> but that's a that's the type of evidence that you got to look at and i i think that uh, the fbi has got this stuff down pat if you study how the fbi goes about solving a case they really have uh, uh they solve them really quick a lot of times most of the time compared to regular police they go right to the source they know what is evidence what isn't evidence they throw the stuff that isn't evidence that's just dirty that's just noise in the system get rid of it and uh go for that that evidence Anyway, just a quick, just a quick question, Rick. That yeah. uh, tooth sample or that casting that you have, is it uh, uh, clean enough that you could compare it against uh, Giganto t- uh, teeth or anything like that? Uh, no, the teeth that Giganto uh, 
that 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 they had um most of them are ground up they didn't have uh, a lot because uh they called it dragon teeth and they thought it was a medicinal had medicinal properties and i've always thought that you know someone want to do some uh, library research they should be researching what uh when uh um the old gold miners used to use a lot of uh asian miners in, in these rivers to dredge and dig and stuff because if they find stuff like that teeth they're going to grind it up and sell it as medicinal you know they're not going to keep it around for some scientists to look at and so if there was any evidence uh close to home um with teeth that's probably what prob that might be what happened to it um but i don't know if uh the question was about this tooth or about this uh impression what yeah, just just as it has it been compared to any of the existing giganto tooth to see if there was any similar structure or anything like that. Uh, that I don't know. Meldrum gave it to me, and he said that he compared it to everything he knew, and he couldn't identify it. Well, I'm sure he would. He would think of that. <laughs> yeah. So, Rick, but tell us. That's, that's the problem. There's too many people in this now. It it there's a lot of noise. Okay. If I, you know, I could show you a whole bunch of tracks that were just recently found, and they all look great, but they're uh, they're questionable because there's just too many people out there now that have access to the little nuances that we look for in some of this stuff. Uh, the you know it's the it's like the world's news cycle. We find out stuff happening halfway around the world a lot sooner than we did, you know, back when this all started. And uh, it's a, it has a detrimental effect uh, a lot of times on, on things. And um, I think that's having a, an effect on us is that we are getting a lot of noise in this research. That yeah, and the fact that the internet is a soapbox for every snake oil salesman out there. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I agree because, I mean, any one of us and, and and probably a thousand others on this on this continent alone could fake a track based upon the information that's readily available and take a cast of it. And, and uh, I mean, I think we see that all the time and on some of these larger – you know, Bigfoot channels or Sasquatch channels that, you know, that are obviously there for the money to the views and that they're seeing, you know, they're getting evidence every time they go out. I mean, I mean, some of it is nonsense, of course, that, you know, they're seeing stuff and pareidolia and things like that. But I think there's a phenomenal amount of hoaxing going on in some of those. And it would be really hard to disprove their evidence just because there is so much information out there. Tell me something, Thomas. Do you uh, long for the good old days when the only woo you had to worry about was Eric Beckshard? <laughs> <laughs> well, he he was the he was the granddaddy of the woo. <laughs> well. Yeah, but there was only a few. But there, there were a lot fewer people. Period involved in this, mm. and. Uh, when you communicated, you either had to pay outrageous long distance calls. Or, for instance, if I was going to talk to Rick about something, I'd write a letter. It would take a week and a half to get to him. He'd have to read it, reply, and it would take a week and a half to get back. <laughs> I mean, so that's just the way it was. Have... Yeah. So that's, in that's, a lot of ways, what... this is much better. But in a lot of ways, it's the worst thing. The Internet's the worst thing that ever happened to this. Yeah. That's that's uh, yeah. that's when uh, the, a Bigfooting or Sasquatching had a romantic side to it. <laughs> Where you could wait for those three week long messages to your single one line question mm -hmm. and wait a month to get a we reply. Should, and if there was a picture in the mail, woo! <laughs> Jumping up and down at the mailbox. Yeah. We could channel uh, Renee a little bit here and uh, say, uh, Oh, no. You know, <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I'm not going to imitate him, but. but um, Never you know, imitate Renee. Yeah. Gold miners. <laughs> Are doing the same sort of thing they in order to keep people the the amateurs away from from the good areas of, of 
gold prospecting. They made little parks and, and said, come on in and you can camp and bring your family and we'll show you how to pan for gold in this area. And it's only going to be $50, you know, that, that you camp here. And uh, that keeps them out of their hair out in the real mining areas. And they make a buck doing it. Yeah. Win-win. So yeah. maybe, maybe that's what some of these organizations are really doing, like the BFRO. Maybe they're doing these little things and saying, hey, we can make some money on the side, but we're keeping them away from our good areas. Well, you were a member of the BFRO for many, many years, Rick. Was that their operas operandi? That I don't know. Okay. I, I know that uh, uh, the process that went with the uh, Skookum expedition was just ridiculous uh, um, on the selection of people. And um, I don't see them doing that now. Haven't, haven't there a standard? I wanted to get into this a little bit later on, but seeing it was brought up now, uh, uh, they've been accused of their standards, uh, rather dipsy doodling over the years, you know, about what is good evidence and what isn't good evidence. Uh, if you remember when Bigfoot Forums first opened, uh, there was quite a few ex-BFRO members who would mm -hmm. post there. Uh, disgruntled, shall we say, BFRO employees. And it seems like uh, that went by the wayside and 10 years later, another wave of disgruntled field agents quit the BFRO. And uh, it always seems to come down from the top what moneymaker's flavor of the day is, I suppose, that people can follow his instructions that well. I, I just always found it hard when they would claim to be the only scientific group in the world investigating the Bigfoot mystery, you know, because I never found them. Some, listen, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of great people in the BFRO, a lot of excellent number one people. But um, I always found it, it just left a bad taste in my mouth every time a new story would come out about, you know, uh, mainly from the top, from Moneymaker and uh, his plans and everything. And especially the past few years where the bar has seemed to just drop on the floor of what is evidence and what isn't evidence. We had our own experience with that, with the moose track that uh, Moneymaker declared the find of the year, 2020. 2021. Give me a break. Our guy solved it in about uh, three hours. <laughs> And he would be here tonight, except he's in hospital at the moment. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's uh, and, and these are the go-to organizations for people newly coming in to Bigfoot and Sasquatch research. So I think that's what ticks me off the most, because these podcasts are generally aimed at the newer. Well, investigator or researcher and how to avoid the pitfalls that we all fell for over the years well, ourselves. Cor cor correct me if I'm wrong, Rick. Um, the BFRO started, uh, what, 1995? Uh, 95, 1995. Well, I wasn't there in, in the very beginning. I joined uh, 97, 98. Okay. Yeah. So now uh, it, it started off. It was supposed to be just a uh, a uh, uh, an organization that had people all over the place, independent researchers who were members, and the idea was if something was reported in this particular area, they'd have someone in the vicinity to go look into it. Originally, yes. So yeah. Then, originally, yeah. Then we got the Flats database. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a poor, a poor database, but they wanted everybody to feed into it information mm -hmm. uh, that they collected or that they had mm -hmm. and have one repository and maybe get something out of it. So I wouldn't say that, you know, the BFRO is the, the you know, the only or the first scientific organization looking for Bigfoot. They're not. I, they never, they should never have said anything like that because it was uh oh the one that uh actually had the the periodicals uh i forget the name of it now but um oh. california bigfoot organization 
No. No, this is uh, after that. Anyway, um, Meldrum was part of that. And that oh, was... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. That side? Maybe. Maybe that's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, he's the first digital organization, I mm. would say. He's the first person to ever get on the internet and use it as a research tool, uh, getting gathering information and communicating uh, almost instantaneously with people. Um, that's the only claim I would say that that they have. And as far as uh, uh, the evidence um, that that you guys have seen and that uh, they have, the BFRO has, has either said. The Arneon or classified it as ABC or whatever they do. Uh, I I never even listen to that stuff anymore because, first of all, the definitions that they have for their classification of evidence is not logical at all. Uh, I don't know where they came up with this stuff. You know, it, it's it's uh, if you had a referee on the side of a football game using the 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 terms and the, and the uh, stuff that they are coming with uh, as uh, how you, how to organize it, this information, nobody would watch the game again because it's, mm -hmm. it's just ridiculous. Uh, the diff What a Class A sighting is compared to a Class B or a Class C, it, it, uh, you know, they didn't think about this at all. And that we had a lot of internal arguments about that. Um, I think one of the things that I always want, felt really strongly about was that we should be rating, uh, looking at this differently, that first of all, um, it's two things that is happening, a human and a, and a Sasquatch come together some for some reason, and you should be looking at why that would be by collecting all the information about it, you know, what kind of clothes, what kind of the time of year, what the activity was, was what kind of noise levels were there, what kind of influence of the area, what's the area like. They don't collect any of that. And um, the other thing that they didn't do was uh, look at the the sightings. Was it, how, how long was the sighting that they had? Was it 10 seconds? Was it... Um, Two days long. Did they see it twice? Did they see it this day and the following day? Did they see it at night? Did they, you know, uh, and then did they see it in the in the morning too, in in regular light? Did they see it in, under different lighting conditions, or is it just something that was fleeting? Because I've seen a lot of fleeting things myself, and mm -hmm. I, I never claimed that they're Bigfoot, although a lot of people have asked me. You better come up and you know tell people that that's Bigfoot, mm -mm. and you know mm -hmm. that's <laughs> what I saw. Mm -mm. So, anyway, that's uh, the the BFRO. I don't know in you know if it ever dies and years later someone writes a book about the BFRO. I think there would be a lot of things like that in it versus. Uh, you know, these, uh, uh, you know, what was that uh, moments? You know, Rick, uh, all the years that you've been into this and are still into it, um, you've never written a book about it or anything like that? I've tried. I've, I've, I've started a book, uh, I don't know, five or six times. And mm -hmm. uh, it's it's different. It's not like one of those books where... You'd just be listing a bunch of things that uh, a bunch of people seeing something or yeah. finding footprints or something like that. But uh, more about, you know, this is something that there's no proof exists. So what kind of proof can I get and what would be that proof as I'm going along? And it would be more on uh, uh, the logic and my... my uh, my journey through it, sort of like uh, what, uh, well, I, I hate to, you know, the butterfly guy, when he wrote his book, uh, I thought it would be a lot better than that. Um, but 
it was more of a joke if if you ask well, me. I, I think he talked about Sasquatch about five pages. Yeah. 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 And and, and then there's a movie out of, on it? Did you guys know about that? Did you yeah, see it? Apparently, yeah. I heard it was in the making. I didn't know it was released. Yeah, it's on the internet. You can mm. uh, you can watch it on the internet on YouTube, I guess. And it's but uh anyway what 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 kind of book would there be you know you don't want something that's already been done and the lord knows everything's been done over and yeah. over well hell i've done it three times and they're all basically the same yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean the, the one of the freshest books that, to come out in uh since john green's i would say would be rob alley's and rob alley's was interesting to me when i read it but it was basically the same storytelling stuff. But it was in from an area. Was that different. the Alaska? Yeah. 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 I love that guy's book. Yeah. Raincoast. Raincoast Sasquatch. Raincoast right. Sasquatch. Yeah. I like Bindernagel's first book because he tied a lot of behavior into it and uh, explained that this behavior is not unprecedented. You know, it, it does happen with other animals. Now, why? Why? That's what I'm interested in. When behavior is apparent and you are observing it and you don't know why, that's what's fascinating is to figure out why would an animal want to do something like this? Or why would a human do this? Or why would that happen? Because the only reason that stuff like that does happen, that the people learn how to do that or animals learn how to do that, is that it's got an evolutionary advantage. It makes them uh, survive better. And to understand that, all of a sudden you start seeing where there could be a nexus where you could meet up with one. Mm -hmm. You can find something that is very important to an animal and cross over at that spot and see it. And hunters do that all the time. Now, you spent a lot of time at the Seattle Zoo, didn't you? Yes. Uh, looking at the gorillas and uh, watching their behavior. Yeah. Did you get anything, uh, you know, anything out of that with regards to their behavior? Yeah, they don't like the pheromone fer uh, pheromone chips. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so testing them out there to to see what they would do, because it was supposed to Bamanek, Doctor um, Bamanek, um, claimed to have these chips made from. Uh, female estrus cycles in uh, gorillas. And they became agitated. But uh, I don't know if all the time I've used them, if it had any effect. But uh, mm. I've noticed some of the behavior, you know, how they would sit on the ground to eat, mm. how they, uh, the economy of energy that they exerted when they were uh, just doing their day to day activity. When they move from point A to point B, when they grab some fruit, food, when they hide it from another animal, um, when they bluff, when they look at something and try to under, it, it, you know, when they stare at you through the through the glass or through the cage, it isn't with intelligence; it's with uh, like awe. Mm. You know, it's it's more like I don't understand what you are. And you're fascinated yeah. to look at, <laughs> but it's not yeah. intelligence. Uh, so who's like, studying who? <laughs> yeah, it's not like how can I get at your neck? <laughs> it's not like that. Uh, come closer, come closer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that you know, I got that from uh, going to the zoo a lot, and, and it also it it built up a search Im image. Okay, when I lose my keys, I think of my keys. I think of how they felt in my hand, where I. Where I, the last time I used yeah. it, what they, what, where they could they could sit and be hidden in shadow, what small uh, was what area is small enough to hide my keys, and that's what I look for, and I invariably I find them. Hmm. Could you do you tell us about your possible sighting, which happened not too far from where we live right here, the three of oh. us. Oh. Uh. Long Heath Highway. You're talking about um, <laughs> the legs. Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, well. We are we were up in uh, my wife and I, and uh, Shelly and uh, another her boyfriend at the time, 
we're camping at a cabin up there on Long Lake, I guess it's called, uh, in, at the head, uh, close to the glacier part of um, Harrison. Oh, oh yeah. And uh, when we came back, we were coming into town, and I don't know where we were going, but we were just passing where the um, the BC bus driver claimed to have seen a Bigfoot years yeah. before. Lake of Rock, Wahi yeah. Highway, yeah, yep. Route 7, yeah. And it was downpouring. It was just coming down really sheet. And I was only, I don't know, maybe uh, 50 feet in, in back of uh, this the guy that was driving, he was driving a uh, Samurai um, four-wheel drive, and I had, uh, I forget the car I was driving. must have been a forerunner. Anyway, um, in between us, I saw something walk right across the road like it had um, pants because it was uh, shaggy. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it didn't move like muscles. It didn't, it, you know, it wasn't. And it wasn't uh, short. They were long. And the headlights only went up so high. And I slammed on the brakes and got on the radio and, and, and called the guy in front of me. And he thought we came back. I don't know what it was, but uh, it, it could have been uh, a shadow, as far as I know. Maybe something flew across the road because it was, it was windy. It was blowing and it was uh, downpouring rain. And it could have been a branch. I've seen branches come down from trees and fly across, and it looks like uh, you know something ran out in front of you. Mm-hmm. But uh, that's that's that. I mean, the other time that something happened was I was coming back from the Skookum area with uh, um, High Check, who was in the back uh, in another vehicle, and I slammed on the brakes because something flew right in front of me, or not. It did fly in front of me because it was a crow. <laughs> but it didn't look like a crow when I was looking because I was looking way past it on the road. And when it flew across, it looked like it was walking across the road. And, and, you know, how you know, with your eyes unfocused uh, on yeah. closer to you, you were, you were focused further away. And I go, what the heck was that? And then Doug just kept on and asked me over and over and over what it was. And I said, I don't think it was a Bigfoot, but it was something. And I thought it was walking across the road, but it, I'm sure it was a crow that just flew across in front of me. I had an owl do the same thing. Come, like, but the owl is different because it, when it comes at you, it has its claws out like this, and that's yeah. all you're seeing. And it's coming up towards, towards the screen. Uh, it's coming up towards my, my windshield and almost hit it. That happened. The, the, the cougar that jumped out, when we were on the set for that um, Giganto, that was, uh, we got off our horses. We went under these trees that were down and I got the horse to come over the tree and, and the other guy did too. We got back on our horse. I gave him my camera and I got up on the horse and I put my camera underneath my arm and I was getting settled. We were still wet because we crossed the river uh, up to our waist in water in that river. And um, so it was kind of, uh, you know, ch- chafing on us. Everything was chafing. And we started to start going, and there's this uh, rock cliff on the side, uh, on the on the right side of us. And something jumped down right in front of us, right over our heads, and landed in the road. The, the, the horses didn't do a thing. They were trained, I guess, to mm. not react like that. But they didn't rear up or anything like that. But I, um, I, I was rearing back, not knowing what it was. And then uh, it stopped right in the road, and all you saw was its butt and, and the tail. Yeah. And then it jumped again, and it was in the you know, gone in the woods. And that was a big cat. And it was weird. I never seen one like these, that. These encounters happen so quickly. So, yeah, Rick, know. Rick, do you remember when we, you and I, were together on Vancouver Island for that Monster Quest episode when we had the thermal hit? Yes, on the trail of something behind us, and and it left, and uh, it left, and it left a, a heat impression on a tree. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still See, wondering about that one. Yeah. Yeah. Those those kind of things. Uh, 
that's what uh, thermal or night vision, that kind of stuff. That's good for detection. It's not going to be good for any proof of something. No, no, because to the average public, it just looks like Casper the Friendly Ghost on a dark screen. Right. Yeah. yeah. The thing about yeah. that was the next day, you and I, uh, you found it first was a possible track uh, on that same path just after that old rickety bridge. Right. Right. Yeah, that was uh, that was interesting out there. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if I'd want to camp out on the on that island again with all the bears and everything but <laughs> <laughs> i swear oh, there was a bear right up on that hill right next uh next yeah. to where we had their fire I, got, I got i got about a half dozen castings behind me here yeah. none of which i took <laughs> and i got a half dozen how many do you have rick uh last count was uh 60. 60. yeah could you talk to us a bit about your casting method? Well, now, various uh, people have described it various ways. I'd like to hear it from you. I think it's the best one I've ever seen, Rick. I'd call B11. Do you still use that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, there's a lot of fine detail that can be in a cat uh, in a, an impression, and so mm -hmm. you got to really examine what you are casting and determine how you're going to uh, cast it, reproduce it. So if it has detail in there that you don't know what it is until you uh, capture it and can study it a little bit better, then you want to be very, very cautious of putting something heavy in there. And so that's when I do uh, uh, a splash cast. Um, it's used, You do the splash, and then, then they do what's called a French cast after that. So you... Um, you let it drip off your fingers. It's really wet, and it's like mm -hmm. you're making it a thin eggshell or like a, a chocolate covering over a piece of fruit. It's really, really delicate, but it's not going to weight down and destroy anything that's little peaks and ridges and, and stuff that might be possible in there. It also captures hair, so it's, it's really kind of nice. If there's hair in there, don't worry about picking it out, you know. But if there's leaves and, and needles and stuff like that in there, that's a problem. Now, I have sometimes not removed them, but I have burnt stuff with a little torch trying to get it out of there and turn it into ash. And that way, it's not going to destroy something. There might be something underneath it that I want to cap. What's your Actually, mixing ra ratio for that, your mixing ratio? Usually, it's uh, two two thirds. Uh, uh, plaster to one third, I mean two thirds uh, water to one third uh, plaster, okay, and two to one. Uh, but when you do your 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 uh, uh, splash cast, it's supposed to be really wet. It's more like uh, a milkshake, a uh, wet milkshake, or, uh, one that's been melted out in the sun. It's not not like milk, but mm -hmm. it's a little bit thicker than milk, and it's not like ice cream. It's like milk and ice cream melted. So it's a little thick, but not not too thick. And then you let it drip off and, and into the cast, and you make sure that there's no little areas where you could not see uh, the white of the plaster. And then you let that, uh, it'll uh, frost over, it looks like. It gets dull. And that's when the moisture comes out, and uh, that's it's still able to adhere to another layer of plaster. It'll, it'll set up on it really good. But it is now hardened enough that it's not going to destroy anything. And if it does crack uh, with the weight of the next batch of plaster, uh, the details underneath it are still there. It still mm. has got that. So um, I carry around at least three buckets, uh, two and a half gallon buckets with a lid. And there's gloves in there because uh, uh, plaster has um, caustic material in there that uh, if you leave it on your hands long enough, will uh, it's a base, will start, uh, uh, like lye, it'll start dissolving. Mm -hmm. like you, you mean hydrocol, not, not plaster, apparently? Uh, well, I call it all plaster, but it's hydrocal, yeah. Yeah. B11, yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Um, there's also densite. Densite's a little bit different. Densite looks a lot better. 
is a lot uh, stronger, but it's more brittle. So you tap it, and it'll shatter like glass. Um, Hydrocal is more like plaster of Paris, but stronger. And plaster of Paris can rub off like chalk. <laughs> you know, you can rub it enough with just your fingers, and, and your finger will act like sandpaper on it. Um, the Skookum cast took uh, quite a bit. It took my three, and then I brought two 50-pound uh, bags, one for um, Leroy, and uh, the other one was for, I think, uh, Jeff Lemley. And they wanted to make up kits just like me with two and a half gallon uh, buckets full of this stuff and just leave them in the car whenever you need them. Mm -hmm. You can't really get a good cast if you just have like a water bottle full of plaster. Mm. That's not enough. It's just not enough. And you can't put things in it. If you put sticks and, and stuff like that in it, that's it's abrasive. It's yeah. yeah, it's just going to make, uh, you know, make it out like honeycomb and then it'll break apart. So inside of the the buckets, I also put wire ties. You can buy a uh, a bundle of them in a little um, plastic thing at at one of these box stores, and they it's a aluminum tie that goes up and then hooks, and that's it. And then you just put one or two of those inside of it, and that will really strengthen it up. Aluminum is pretty good inside of that uh, hydrocal. Hydrocal really gets rid of the water after a while. You can also bake it afterwards. Um, plaster of Paris, not so much. It's still permeable, and that uh, aluminum will start um, corroding, and then it'll break apart. Uh, Densite, you usually use steel to reinforce it inside of there. I didn't have that on the Skookum. I had to use uh, my tent poles, and um, they were, you know, the types where you they're, they weren't the types where uh, they spring up uh, and they had the cords in them. It wasn't like that. Yeah. These were the ones where you put them together and. Oh, that's that's an old old school. <laughs> yeah. And so I had those, and I put X a big X in that from corner to corner, and um, uh, determining what you're going to cast, you really have to. Uh, I prefer a second opinion and on the skookum i missed an area because it was just well, we didn't have enough but it was the scrape marks either it was fingers or it could have been antlers or, but it looked more like fingers than antlers uh and outside of that was where the pile of fruit was mm -hmm. and so we didn't get weren't able to get that those scrape marks but uh, the arm section with the, the this line right here, that, that line, and um, the heels, and the possible footprint that was right next to it, because uh, I I have some pictures where it shows what looks like the footprint that's next to the heel, and the heels uh, destroyed part of the uh, the footprint so that it looks like it's only a couple of toes, um, but uh, then there's another spot over that looks like it was a footprint and then something knelt in it like a knee went in and sat on some of it. And the hair pattern on both of them, uh, I don't know, Meldrum was the expert on that. I left it up to them to figure out what it was. All I did was capture the evidence. Did you get any DNA samples out of that? Um, there was or possible. Some there was three sets of hairs that uh, that we collected, and there was about 15 hairs in each of the samples. And mm -hmm. um, we gave one set to Henner, and uh, so the the sets I got a set, Fish got a set, and uh, Derek Randall's got a set, and Leroy I believe gave his set to Henner. And also worked with Henner on uh, mounting them. And Henner said that uh, there was one in there that was not uh, bare or um, ungulate and uh, matched his other stuff. So there was no DNA at that time. There was mm -hmm. just a, a comparative optical comparison. Oh, I see. Hair. I see. 
So yeah. the, you look at, on that, you look at the medulla inside, if it's missing, and also was it cut hair on the end? Uh, yeah. or, or was it frayed or was it tapered? And these were frayed. So it was like it was uh, worn. It was, uh, it's been out there a while. It wasn't something new, like someone just bought a, you know, uh, a chamois that was still had fur on it, went out there and laid it down and put their yeah. knee on it and then lifted it back out and left. So are, you still doing, are you still doing extended field trips? Yeah. I, I I keep whatever I'm doing pretty much to myself. So yeah. Get, so I don't get noise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you I still go, have a, uh, a general uh, research area that you stick to? Well, I'm not. The areas don't reveal are, it. Just yeah. uh, yes or no. The areas are not like they used to be. Uh, that I that I have. It's more of the types of areas, mm -hmm. and so I'm looking for a specific types of areas. And when I find those, that's when I go there and I, I keep on going there, but I go at specific times. And the negative data is just as important to me as the positive data. When I had a study site out like uh, on the Seattle, uh, I was collecting both all the negative data and the positive data until there was other, a bunch of other people coming out and they would go and not tell me anything. So I didn't get negative or positive data. And, and so now I'm finding out later some of these stories that are coming out, and it's just noise uh, with my information. I don't know if it's the same stuff that I was finding or if it was duplicate or if it was something completely different or what. And so you, you've got to kind of uh, – that's why I said there's like too many people in this now. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, too many hands in the soup. Well, Rick, just to make it a bit more complicated, we're going to talk a little bit of how they can get into that soup. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, you've got water, you've got shelter, and you've got food. Now, does this enhance the possibility of a Sasquatch sighting? If you've got all three of those things together, as opposed to any other kind of terrain or... Well, I'm looking at... Uh... Like I said before, the the reason why, why would an animal be in a specific spot? Mm -hmm. Why do you find an elk in a specific spot? Why do you find a cougar in a specific spot? Uh, what what kind of characteristics are you looking for of in an area where you can have these encounters? And if you look at the ones that are fleeting. You know where you just see it uh, mm -hmm. crossing the road, uh, or uh, you know that basically that's it. You know crossing the road. Most humans that see one of these, it's crossing a road, right? It's not. They're not out in the woods hiking and seeing one unless you're an ex-foot uh, base or uh, basketball player that uh, was going to the bathroom. Um, <laughs> but I <I'm> <laughs> You gotta go. You gotta go. Yeah, I would say most of the time it is crossing the road that that the, that someone s says that they see something, and um, that isn't a very good behavior. There's just roads all over the place, and animals you know, cross them all the time. That are really really important uh, to me are the ones that there's a reason behind the encounter. There there's something there something specific that has been reported and is cropping up in other uh, encounters and that the encounter lasts longer than just uh mm -hmm. you know, a few seconds Fleeting it's something glimpse. yeah yeah it's more than a glimpse it's more it, it's it's got some length to it that uh someone is not mistaken as what they saw and so like the sixes this thing happened there several times that's good. Something happened. I'm also looking where there's researchers. I think it's very important that you have a map that shows you all the researchers that are active in the area. So like for Washington, you can have all these little pinpoints and yeah. there's these pinpoints of these active researchers. You'll find 
that, or I find actually, that there's a lot of activities that is getting reported around those and nowhere else. Well, I try and stay away from those areas where the people are uh, the, tripping over each other's are. feet. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, where the researchers are um, is that's where a lot of noise comes from in, in my my mind. So I'm looking at those those uh, those types of sightings uh, or reports that have some length to them and some real meat to their story that uh, gives me uh, some attributes to look at and uh, uh, match it up with other areas. And so I don't have a specific area anymore. I have multiple areas that when I do a little bit of research on a, on a sighting and find out, uh, like in the sixes, uh, these, have you guys ever, you know anything about the Sixes Rivers down there in, in uh, Oregon? Other than the stories, the uh, it's a very very narrow canyon. Looks a lot like the Seattle, um, and where where this happened, uh, uh, the miners were killed, and where um, uh, the two individuals came out and said that they saw this this these, this creature there, and it was very aggressive. There's not going to be an elk in there. There's not going to be any calving going on. There's not, uh, what kind of food in there? I don't know. But uh, it's very, very steep and rugged and very, very hard to get into. It's not easy. That was back in the 1890s, wasn't it, yeah. when the miners were killed? Yeah. yeah. And there's still no road into that area. There's a road going all the way around it, but not into where... Hell's, Can uh, Hell's Gate was and, and a couple of places inside there where it is, but the graves are still there for the miners. Uh, it's a national cemetery or a, a, a state cemetery, they call it. And um, so there's some areas like that uh, that are very, very inaccessible up in the Seattle uh, as well. And I don't know if a lot of other people weren't really paying attention um, to what I was doing up there until they saw it on TV. But the Seattle had some areas where people were disappearing. Mm. And these people were disappearing, not, you know, really regularly, but they were experienced people. And they were going into a specific area that had a lot of fissures and uh, pockets and, and boulders and stuff that were grown over but there were pockets where the vegetation mm -hmm. the only thing going over the holes and they could fall down in and actually get lost really easy and there was a couple of famous people that got lost up in there in the illabot um and then it's also volcanic uh but uh, the six is really looks like that and there's a couple of places on the peninsula that really look like that as well um and I haven't found stuff like what Derek uh, over on the peninsula has found, which is the uh, they're they're claiming that they they found these uh, nests looking kind of things. But Owen Caddy and I we found some stuff with uh, the shoot meadows. Um, those are uh, those are really popular uh, hunting grounds for gorillas in in Africa. Um, on the mountain slopes is they call them shoot meadows because it's a shoot of of uh, that goes down the side of a mountain and the animals crawl up them because there's it just wipes away the everything and then the first things that grow in there are the things that they like to eat and they just call them a shoot meadow I guess so do that's where that's, do you think that the the, the Bigfoot just uh in their eyes, just find people an annoyance. I mean, I don't see uh, people's presence in many reports um, that are uh, changing uh, the, uh, how do I say it? Um, like whatever the Bigfoot or Sasquatch was doing at the time it was observed, very few of them changed their pattern. They either carry on with what they were doing whether that's eating berries or whatever, like on Micah Mountain, 
or uh, they walk across roads, uh, they hear a vehicle coming or something, yes, they will stop. They will wait for that vehicle to go by, then they will cross the road. Uh, hence, I think that they look at us as just a necessary annoyance they have to put up with every now and then. They're not afraid of us, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think they're afraid of us except for if it depends on the activity that they're doing. Like if they mm -hmm. were, if it was food that they were gathering or if it was their mating or if they, they were rearing their young, uh, uh, where they want to feel safe. If they were just traversing an area, it would be, which is when I think they have an encounter with us is when they're traversing an area. They're not really yeah. in their home range like, uh, you know, uh, Otsman's story. <laughs> Uh, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, that's that's a totally different kind of thing, uh, but most of them are uh, they're just they're going from point A to point B, or you know, yes. uh, that's simplistic, but they're just traveling, and um, yeah, I, I think. Like my, well, I, I guess you could say if one of them was walking along and saw you, would have turned around and go back the other way to avoid you possibly but the only ones that we see are the ones who don't turn around and go back the other way well it's, yeah. it's like it's like what i said before i think uh, the parish and gimling encounter in 67 was if those horses hadn't reacted they may have ridden right on by or yeah. never been the wiser right yeah yeah absolutely they absolutely. didn't have horses and they were on foot yeah. they may not have even seen her yeah mm -hmm. yeah and uh so to her it was just a matter of stay still they'll pass on by ignore them kind of thing they're a necessary nuisance uh, uh, micah uh, Mike mountain micah mountain there's an example right there up on the yellow head where he observed this female for what 20 minutes or something eating berries william william Rowe. william Rowe, uh, 20 minutes or more while she ate berries until she started to get annoyed with him and barked at him a couple of times and then turned and walked off in a huff, you know? So, I mean, she wasn't afraid of him. I, I actually, think actually, see, uh, actually I see, uh, go ahead, Thomas. No, sorry, Bill. I was saying the William Rowe gets, it's one of the few I ever, ever heard. And it's one of the classics. Uh, a few instances I ever heard where a person was able to observe one and it didn't seem to know that somebody was there. And uh, when it did spot him, Willem described the look on its face as almost comical. It was so mm -hmm. shocked to see him there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, you know, we have a parallel in, in known animals. If you look on trail cameras in, in, in Banff National Park, and you've also got it in the Kainai Peninsula in Alaska, where they have grizzly bears walking along regular footpaths that, that have tourists on them, and they've got video showing the grizzly bear walking down the footpath. Here's people. They step off the trail a couple of feet. The people walk by without even seeing them. And then the grizzly bear gets back on the on the trail and continues on the way. And I think you may have, you know, if Sasquatch exists, you may get similar behavior to that where, you know, they're walking. Because all animals are lazy. If there's a nice path, they'll take it. So if they're walking down a path and they hear us or see us first, they just might just step off the trail a couple of feet, wait for us to go by, and then carry on about their business. Yeah, and I've uh, had so many many witnesses tell me it was standing so still they hadn't looked right at it, they never would have known it was there. Well, so that, know, that's the that flight or up, flight. What, go ahead. What do you think uh, the eyesight of these creatures are? Mm -hmm. Is it like a bears, like a cat's? Is, is it meaning good or nearsighted or farsighted? Or is it like ours where we can see, you know, pretty good at all those distances? Yeah. Or everybody has a different opinion on that one. You know, okay. let's let's not get into eye shine and all the rest. Not, it's, that. Uh... not that, but I'm thinking, you know, like, did you see Grizzly Man uh, with uh, Timothy Treadwell? Yes. He had, he had a bear come right up in back of him while he was filming and stood up because he couldn't see what was going That's on, right. but he heard stuff. That's right. A Sasquatch doesn't do that. 
it, it's never done that. So it must, I think, I think Sasquatch can see pretty good. I don't think it can mm-hmm. smell as good as it can see. So animals, uh, if it's standing upright, you know, most people might even not even notice that it's a, a Sasquatch. It could be just a couple of people walking, you know, further down down the, the shoreline and not recognize anything different it's on four feet yeah i'd recognize it but uh it was within four feet of of them wow yeah uh i must dig that i uh, i let it someone i never got it back so i had to buy it again yeah so uh yeah i must dig through that get it off the bookshelf and uh dig through so you're a technical kind of guy aren't you there yeah. What do you think of using drones for trackways and such? Um, for trackways? Yeah. Uh, for following they're, trackways or what have you? They're okay, but uh, you know the the photography with that isn't really good for close up views of of uh, of um, tracks. Uh, it'd be okay to try and. Uh, you know, maybe be uh, 10, 15 feet off the ground and mm-hmm. follow a track line. But I don't know about following that with, with something like that uh, versus uh, using the drone for, for other reasons. Um, uh, what other reasons would I use a, a drone for? Well, I would. Wrecking. For what? A recce, or as you Americans call it, a recon. A recon? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, you could do that, but uh, they have ones out now that are uh, that follow you. Mm-hmm. Oh, you have a tag or you have a, a wrist thing, and you could put it on a dog, and it could follow the dog and have the mm-hmm. dog go running around, yep. uh, you know, stuff like that. Um, but uh, they're pretty noisy. Uh, I know that. I have one, and... They're pretty noisy. Oh, um, when you get to a certain height, though, and then you can't hear them anymore. It's, uh, of course, it depends on the size of the drone, too. You know, yeah. I think they're, I think they're good for going along, uh, exploring rivers and stuff in the banks, just to see if there's something there. Saves you uh, two hours of hiking to check out that sandbank halfway down the creek, when uh, you can see if there's something there to look at in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. I, for tracks my, and stuff, yeah, yeah. My fascination is inside of uh, uh, berry patches. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot of animals that actually there's a uh, there's a couple of um, encounters down there in the sixes where they said that they saw uh, these creatures going in and out of berry patches and climbing underneath, and like they dug out. Yeah, to get rid of you know, get away from the stickers and everything. But uh, they were living on apparently underneath these big berry patches. And the Indians, uh, the Native Americans, were saying the same sort of thing that uh, they shared the better berry patches with uh, these creatures. So it's it's an inaccessible place. It's protected with those thorns. Uh, so I don't know. I would use a pole with a camera on it. Or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have one of and those. Also, so Thomas. Yeah, so I would, you know, for uh, a thing that you could do is you could do uh, a zip line camera and put it in uh, in the forest, set one up, and just have it going back and forth while mm-hmm. you're in the area. Well. Yeah, it, I don't know if it would flush out or you just capture it at some t- point because cameras see a cone. And not, unless you get a 360 camera, and those are not the best. Uh, although now the, the new, uh, what do you, uh, the new uh, GoPros that are 360, mm-hmm. they have a camera hemisphere on each side of the camera or uh, each side of the, the device. Those are kind of interesting, but uh, still, uh, what, what is photography going to do? Is is it going to prove it? Prove that no. they really exist? 
I think it should only be a tool for giving you extra evidence, not proving it to anybody. You know, you're not going to prove anything with a drone, no matter what you film. Right. But uh, I think it can be just another tool that you can use, you know, right. while you're out yep. there looking, just like a pair of binoculars or anything else or measuring yep. tape or what have you. It's just another tool. You, know, so, you, may, you may remember, Rick, we set up a lot of your trip cameras when we were out on Vancouver Island and you had your little star foam rock covering, camouflaging yeah. it and all that. Yeah. And one of the funny, and the only thing I didn't like about the finish of the episode that the very last scene is you and me examining the footage and they almost tried to make it look like we had something there in the dark. But I am totally convinced that what that camera was filming was me coming to check it in the dark. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> I remember that. They had me go out and check it. When I came back, they said, okay, nothing happened to you. Now, can you do it again while we film it? <laughs> <laughs> right. I think shooting right. uh, Sasquatch yeah. is illegal in this country. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Speaking yeah, so, of which, Rick, Rick do yeah. you, are you still armed when you go out into the bush? Yes. I, yeah. I am armed all the time. I have uh, uh, usually a handgun, uh, but uh, I also have the forty five seventy. Mm-hmm. That's nice. Yeah, that'll stop anything. <laughs> well, Too late I don't know. Poorly. I hope so. <laughs> you uh, hope. Well, we'll let you test it out. <laughs> See how it works. <laughs> it's a single shot, so <laughs> you, know, it's not like... you better be good then. <laughs> yeah, it's a breech yeah. load, so I, I'd have to, you know, it's a little tough reloading. Yeah, see, we're backward up here. We're not allowed to carry firearms into the woods unless you live uh, some godforsaken place that you can only get to by airplane or something like that. Then well, you can have handguns. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, a handgun. Mm. Then you can get a special license to carry a handgun. Otherwise, yeah. uh, forget it. So, yeah. Well, we have the advantage matter. here that uh, I can carry a short-barreled rifle. Where in the U.S. they need a special tax stamp for it, so uh, you know um, there there's pros and cons. Though I think uh, you down south have a lot more pros than cons uh, when it comes to comparing to Canada. Yeah, I have yeah. Uh, I have a concealed weapons permit for almost every state in the in the United States, and I carry it all the time in, in the different states that I go to. Hmm. I'm just trying to hold on to the guns I got before the government comes and takes them. Yeah. Which they are planning on doing. Yeah. It's just yeah. maybe as soon as the end of this year. Maybe well, soon. look at the Ukraine. It's uh they're handing them out. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, when, uh, hey, it's, for it's an army invasion, that happens. It's, yeah. it's a wonder that our Prime Minister Trudeau hasn't come up with the idea. Let's take the guns from the legal gun owners and send them over to the Ukrainians. <laughs> Everybody will be happy, and I'll get reelected again. He hasn't yeah. thought of that yet. If he thought of it, he would. Yeah. yeah. So, huh. tell me something. We're running up. Uh, where are we here? Let me look. We're running up to the hour and a half mark now at the moment. Can I ask each one of you, including myself, one last question? And that is, once bitten by the Sasquatch or Bigfoot bug, is there ever going back? What do you think? Is it ever going back? Is the day going to come when you say, I had enough of this? I've shot my shot. Time to move on to something else. What do you think, Rick? Uh, I've done that a couple of times. I've uh, stepped <laughs> away, <laughs> stepped away, and it gives you a different perspective. You, you, when you step away, you go, "I'm looking at this wrong," because <laughs> yeah. it's not working. So what do I do? What do I, you know? And it's a good way of just, uh, you know, making sure you're still on a path, going somewhere, instead mm-hmm. of uh, all of a sudden waking up and you know you're in the bushes. Yeah. So I, th- I think it's good, and I, I do that, but you keep coming back to it. I think that's the important part, is that you keep coming back. I left it, too, for about six years. Never read anything, never watched anything, never talked to anyone about it. But then just when you think you're out, they pull you back in again. Yeah. What about you, Bill? 
I think, and, and I was fortunate enough that Thomas introduced me to John Green a number of years ago, and I asked the same question to John Green, and I think he had the best answer. He says that all of us, we go through different periods of time where certain, in our life where certain things are important. He said, you know, sometimes in his career, his family was the most important thing. He had stepped back from Sasquatch and he focused on his family. Other times, building his career was the most important thing and he focused on that. And then sometimes Sasquatch. And I think that's what most of us do. Like, you know, when I was younger, I did a lot in, on Sasquatch. But when my first got married and my kids were young, I focused on the kids, focused on the family life, and and I really left most Sasquatch most for, for most of it, and then it comes back. And I think, you know, other than some people where it's a consuming passion, I think most of us can put it in our life in a, in a healthy perspective where we can step away from it when it's the other you know other things are important in our life and pull back into it when when it fits in. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think that's the healthiest way to do it. Yeah. And of course, I picked the most unhealthiest way. I, uh, oh, you're started, upset. I started you're looking upset. in 78 and I've never stopped. Um, I don't have a family and this is the biggest reason why I don't. And uh, the only time I ever stopped in all those years was when I did my military service and I had to do other things for a little while. Yeah. But when we had our own time off, most of the guys, their party was alcohol and chasing women. Me, I went in the bush looking for Sasquatch, and I was the weird one. And you never became an alcoholic? No. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I, I vowed to never drink again, and after New Year's Eve 1989, I'd never broken it. Yeah. Well, the way I look at it, I'm in my late 60s. I have no, no thoughts of uh, this mystery being solved before I croak. It hasn't it, been solved in 50 years. It ain't going to be solved solved in the next 15 or 20. But if it is solved and becomes everyday zoology rather than cryptozoology, I'd be more than happy to give it all up, hand my stuff off to the, any museum that wants it, and uh, go on to something else. Don't forget to chop the hands and feet off. <laughs> Put them in a bag. And uh, who are you going to call? Mr. Meldrum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, it's fa It's a fascinating topic. The whole, uh, the whole thing. Uh, I just uh, loved getting back into it again. And uh, I figured, you know, if you're going to get back into it again, be useful instead of doing something for yourself, do something for someone else. And that's why I created these podcasts. And I hope that people who are just getting into this can pay attention and learn something uh, even if you walk away with nothing else tonight, you learn that Rick Knoll is a great guy and he knows about putting down cast. So write down everything he said. And uh, be careful of the woo. Be careful of uh, the, the fifth estate. Uh, we discussed that on another podcast. <laughs> you can't trust newspaper people. And uh, yeah, so you know, if someone was around pointing all that stuff out 20 years ago, it might have been a different story for me and a bunch of sad other people but uh i like it i like doing this what i like what gives me passion is talking to the people talking to you guys that's what gives me the passion for it because i find the people to be just as interesting or even more interesting at times than the animal and i think we can all agree on that <laughs> like most of our friends i'm sure came to us through this you know, well, all my, the, my all oldest the other ones ran away a long time ago. <laughs> my my oldest daughter, when she was in university, still doing her uh, anthropology, she used to go to our our uh, Sasquatch lunches that we used to have, you know, pre COVID, and she said, yeah, she was going to do her uh, her masters on the Sasquatch people because she said we were every bit as fascinating as the subject that we were studying. For both good where reasons else, and bad reasons. <laughs> where, where, the, where the hell else can you find a John Green and a Rennie de Hinden? You know, I or a John Thomas Steenberg for that matter. Or, well, I wasn't going to bring that up, you know. But uh, I you mean, never do one of these out kicking me, can you? <laughs> John, John Green, this zoological type, a type uh, personality that you know thinks it's it's an ape, it's an animal, nothing more, nothing less. 
and yet he'll, he would be the first one to point, ah, careful what you say about Eric. He's a friend of mine. <laughs> Speaking of Eric Beckjord and Thomas Powell. Oh, Thomas writes some pretty good stuff, he told me once. <laughs> okay, I'm sure he's a nice man, but I don't exactly follow uh, uh, his uh, policies. And, uh, but uh, no, it met, made a lot of good friends in this uh, line of endeavor. And uh, it's just too juicy to give up, you know, it's just too juicy. And on that vein, uh, before we go, I would like to just give a shout out to our uh, to our buddy, pal, and colleague, uh, Leon Thompson, who's in hospital in Kelowna tonight. He's out of the ICU now, and he's on a ward. And, Good. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, uh, he is in hard shape. He's able to speak. You can understand some of what he says from some people who spoke to him on the telephone. But the boy has a long way to go on recovery, definitely a long way to go. So we're always missing a seat here every time we do a podcast. Rick, it's been absolutely fantastic having you here, man. Thanks I for mean, having me. Yeah. I mean, like I told you before, I wanted you here for a long time, and I'm so glad that you finally came out tonight. I hope you'll drop back. Sure. Anytime. I mean, uh, we'd love to have you again, man. Like I say, you're one of the go-to icons. I mean... Uh, you, you and Thomas, uh, you're honest brokers. I like that you're honest brokers. You don't have to think twice about motivation and who you are and everything else. You wear it on your sleeve. So, yeah. So that's it, folks. I hope you enjoyed the podcast tonight. And uh, Rick Knoll, I hope we'll be back to join us again. As I say, a shout out to Leon and Thomas and Bill. Thank you for coming along tonight and making this a lot more interesting production than it would have been otherwise. And uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, listeners, I hope you enjoyed yourself. And uh, listen, if, if you enjoy these podcasts, you like these podcasts, uh, go to, the, to, to our YouTube page and uh, hit the subscribe button so we know what we're doing has some kind of value here. Aside from that, God bless. Have a good night. And uh, keep on searching. Okay, dear listener, that about wraps it up for now. My name is Jerry Matthews. You can reach me at yellowcoyote at talus.net. Thank you for your interest. And until the next time, keep searching. <laughs>